Hi everyone, I am Sujani, Faculty in Physics at Institute of Aeronautical Engineering, Hyderabad. Today we are going to see the second part of Module 3, uh, that is uh, Fiber Optics. First, we will go through the introduction and we will clearly understand the principle, construction and working of optical fiber. Let us see the brief outline of uh, today's topic for discussion. We will first understand the principle, then construction and then the working of an optical fiber. So, optical fiber is a flexible, transparent fiber which is made of extruded glass or plastic which is slightly thicker than a human hair. We know the size of a human hair, how small it is. If you talk about optical fiber, it is almost slightly thicker than a human hair and it can function as a waveguide or light pipe to transmit light between the two ends of the fiber. So, if we take an optical fiber, if light enters from one end, it transmits through the fiber and this optical fiber acts as a waveguide and transmits it to the other end of the fiber. Then power over fiber, that is we call them as POF, optical cables can also work to deliver an electric current for low power electrical devices. Most of the time we use it to carry the signal but POF cables are used to carry or to deliver electric current for low power electrical devices. Whenever we see an optical fiber, we see them as bunches. In practical purposes, wherever we see in connections, we see the optical fiber as a bunch put together which carries the signals. Now, where are they used? They are widely used in fiber optic communications. In communications, it has got lot of importance where they permit transmission over long distances and at higher bandwidths. So, this is very important here. It can transmit the signals over very large distances and also they have higher bandwidths than the wire cables. Wire cables here mean we are talking about the conventional wires that we use for carrying the signals or the copper cables. So, what is bandwidth here? Bandwidth always refers to the difference in frequency, the difference between the highest and the lowest frequency which it can carry, we call it as the bandwidth. So, once the bandwidth is high, so the data rates also will be high. So, optical fiber is used in communication. They can transmit signals over very large distances and also at higher bandwidths than wire cables. Now, fibers are used instead of metal wires because signals travel along them with less loss and also immune to electromagnetic interference. So, this is also one more advantage of using the optical fibers. So, what is happening here? There is less loss of signal. Whatever signal we are sending through the optical fiber is emitted at the other end with minimum loss. So, the signal is not lost and also it is immune to electromagnetic interference. Electromagnetic interference here refers to the disturbance that is caused due to electromagnetic radiations. So, when the electromagnetic radi interference is uh, less or it is immune to it, you know, it is not affected due to the electromagnetic interference, then the signal can be transmitted in a very smooth manner with minimum loss. Then optical fibers are also used for illumination. 
and they are wrapped in bundles so that they may be able to carry images. If you see the figure here, so for illumination purposes or for decoration purposes also we use this optical fiber and whenever we use them we are using them in bundles so that they may be used to carry the images. Now let us see the brief history of optical fiber. The history of optical fiber dates back to mid 1800s and the idea of using speed of light to transmit information was well analyzed by scientists and inventors like John Tyndall and Alexander Graham Bell. So these are the two scientists who first analyzed that we can use light or the speed of light can be used to transmit the information. So whenever we are using an optical fiber and when we use light as the carrier, so the information can be transmitted at the speed of light. Then another scientist by name William Wheeler, he researched on the technology behind them. So he wanted to understand what is the technology on which these works. And then another group of scientists, Corning Glass researchers, including Robert Morier and Donald Keck and Peter Sklerge, they first invented fiber optic wires. Initially, they were called optical waveguide fibers and they were able to carry 65,000 times more data than copper cables. So, when they first... Uh, found these cables, they have introduced these optical waveguide fibers and they have calculated what is the data that is carried by the copper wires and the data that an optical fiber can hold. So they found out that it is 65,000 times more than the data that can be carried by a copper cable. So it was a huge development and it was patented. Patented here means the intellectual property rights were preserved for them and nobody else can use their idea without their knowledge. Then in the year 1977, the first telephone communication system using fiber optic cables was created in Chicago and fiber optics grew from there. So, if you see the telephone communications, it was there before also, but using ordinary cables, that is copper cables, metal wires they were using. But then in 1977, they started the telephone communication using fiber optic cables. And then by the end of 1990, about 80% of globe's long distance data traffic was transmitted through fiber optic cables. So 80% is a big number. By the year 1990, most of the transmission that is long distance transmission that is happening or the data transfer that is happening happened with the help of these optical fibers. And the first full leaf optical fiber was buried underneath the Pacific Ocean in 1996 paving the way for faster international data transmission. So with the help of these cables which are connecting under the ocean, they, were, uh, they could lay them under the ocean in the year 1996, which helped them for faster, even international communication was also possible because of that. And if you see fiber optics globally, so, you will be surprised to see how fiber optics cables are connecting different countries. You can see these fiber optic cables, the colored wires connecting different countries and different continents in a sense. So, it will be very surprising and interesting to know how this optical fiber communication takes place and how communication has become very fast with the help of these optical fibers. Now, let us understand the structure of optical fiber. Optical fiber consists of three main parts. There are 
three main parts the core the cladding and the coating these are the three main parts and of course there will be some other protective layers which we will call them as a buffer and the outer jacket but when it comes to the main parts it is the core the cladding and the coating first let us understand about the core core is a cylindrical rod of dielectric material so when we are talking about core it is a cylindrical rod of dielectric material it is made up of dielectric material like silica or glass and it is a cylindrical rod and if you see when we are saying rod you can imagine we have already discussed that its size is slightly greater than the size or the thickness of the hair so this cylindrical rod is also of that size and light propagates mainly along the core of the fiber when we talk about light propagating through an optical fiber it is the core that carries the light or that carries the signal and this core is generally made up of glass most of the optical fibers we see the core is made up of glass and the core is described to have an index of refraction n1 we also call it as refractive index so the refractive index refractive index of the core is denoted by n1 so this refractive index plays a very important role in transmitting the signal we are going to understand in the next few slides and the diameter of the core is usually 10 to 100 micrometer micro means what 1 micro is 10 power minus 6 meter 1 micrometer is 10 power minus 6 meter so you can imagine how small the diameter of the core is you can uh, take it from 10 into 10 power minus 6 to 100 into 10 power minus 6 meter so small the core is now coming to the cladding the core is surrounded by a layer of material called cladding now you have the core the core is surrounded by cladding which is generally made up of glass or plastic means when you see an optical fiber you can have a glass core with a glass cladding or you may have a glass core with a plastic cladding because cladding can be of glass or plastic depending upon the usage then the cladding layer is also made up of a dielectric material and the index of refraction is n2 so for core we have denoted the refractive index by n1 and for cladding we are denoting the refractive index by n2 now the refractive index of the cladding material is less than that of the core so refractive index of the cladding is less means n1 should always be greater than n2 means the refractive index of core should always be greater than the refractive index of cladding this is one main condition in optical fibers then the diameter of the cladding is usually 100 to 200 micrometer again this is also micrometer so you can understand the core is 10 to 100 micrometer and the diameter of the cladding is 100 to 200 micrometer so the entire diameter will not be more than 200 micrometer now let us see the functions of the cladding what are the functions of this cladding it reduces the loss of light from the core into the surrounding air so when we have seen the function of the core the core is the main part that carries the signal or that carries the light wave now when you see in the figure here this is the core this 
is made up of glass so it is not so visible uh, so this is the core and the core is now surrounded by cladding so this is the cladding core is surrounded by the cladding what is happening here when the signal passes through the core it should not be lost to the surroundings it has to travel through the fiber and reach the other end so the main function of the cladding is to reduce the loss of light from the core into the surrounding air it also reduces the scattering loss at the surface of the core so when the signal is traveling through the core there may also be scattering different types of scattering we are going to discuss when we are going to discuss about losses in fibers so this cladding also helps in reducing the scattering loss at the surface of the core and it also protects the fiber from absorbing the surface contaminants so when the core is surrounded by the cladding it is like a protection for the core and it protects it from absorbing the contaminants whatever materials that come in contact with be it the moisture or the heat whatever it is it is protecting the core and it also adds mechanical strength it gives strength to the fiber because most of the cases we have seen we are using a glass core and then when we have a cladding which is either made up of glass or plastic it adds mechanical strength to the optical fiber now coming to the silicon coating so we have seen the first part this first part is the core and covering the core we had the cladding this is the cladding we have seen the cladding now over the cladding we have a coating which we are calling it as silicon coating so silicon coating is provided between the buffer jacket and the cladding so this is our cladding and this is our buffer jacket this is the buffer jacket so where is our silicon coating the silicon coating is in between the buffer jacket and the cladding so what is the order we see here we have the core then we have the cladding and after the cladding we have the silicon coating and this silicon coating is in between the buffer jacket and the cladding now what is a buffer jacket the silicon coating is surrounded by the buffer jacket it is understood and buffer jacket is made up of plastic and it protects the fiber cable from moisture so this buffer jacket is mainly meant to protect the fiber from moisture now what are the functions of the fiber buffer is a layer of material used to protect the optical fiber from physical damage and the material used for buffer is a type of plastic and this material is elastic in nature and it prevents the abrasions means any uh, external damage that is caused due to external environment is protected with the help of this buffer so it is elastic in nature means you can bend it very easily and it also prevents the abrasions because most of the times we may be using glass core with glass cladding or glass core with plastic cladding so there should not be any abrasions any marks or any scars on that core so that is why we use buffer for protection then comes the strength member so we have seen the core the cladding then the silicon coating then the buffer jacket now the next one is the strength member buffer jacket is surrounded by the strength member and it provides strength to the optical fiber means the function of this is only to provide strength to the fiber because we have seen the diameters are very small so then they become very delicate to handle so they need strength so that is why we are using this strength member to give strength to the optical fiber and then finally we have an outer jacket 
If you see in the figure here, this is the outer jacket. So, what is the outer jacket? This uh, cable or the optical fiber is covered by a polyurethane. It is a polyurethane outer jacket. And because of this arrangement, fiber cable will not be damaged during pulling, bending, stretching, rolling. And though the fiber cable is made up of glasses. So, whenever we are using optical fibers for transmission, especially in communication, you may have to lay these optical fibers from one point to the other point. So, then we may have to pull the wires or you may have to bend it around the corners. Okay. Or you may have to roll them sometimes. So, during this process, it should not get damaged because inside what we have, the core and the cladding are generally made up of glass. They should not get damaged. So, that is why we have this polyurethane outer jacket. After the strength member, we have the polyurethane outer jacket which protects it uh, from all these kind of damages. So, if you see finally the structure of the optical fiber, even though we have discussed that there are three main parts, core is the first one, uh, cladding the second one and the coating we say third. But all the other things also serve for either protection or for giving the strength. After the silicon, we had the buffer jacket. And after buffer jacket, we have a strength member which gives strength to the optical fiber. And for all types of protection, we have this polyurethane outer jacket. Now coming to the characteristics of optical fiber, they are of small size and light in weight when compared to electrical cables. So, conventional cables are made up of metal. So, when they are made of metal, definitely their weight is more and also the size is more. But optical fibers are small in size and they are lighter in weight when compared to other conventional electrical cables. And also they are flexible. Flexible means you can bend them in any way you want and they have a very high tensile strength. So, what is the tensile strength here? The load which it can bear before it breaks. That is what we call as a tensile strength. So, they are flexible also and they have very high tensile strength. So, they can be twisted and bent very easily. That is the advantage of having this optical fibers and also optical uh, fiber communication is uh, free from electromagnetic interference. So, there is no uh, effect of the electromagnetic fields. We have seen that electromagnetic interference here refers to the disturbance that is caused due to electromagnetic radiation. Whenever where there is a communication happening, if there is any electromagnetic radiation surrounding it, it may interfere with the signals and then the signal may get distorted or interfered. So, if we are using optical fiber communication, because it is free from electromagnetic interference, the signal can be transmitted very easily without any disturbance. Then fiber optics do not carry high voltage or current. So, therefore, they are very safe than electrical cables. So, if you are seeing electrical cables, they carry very high voltage and high current. But optical fibers, they are safe because they are operating at very low voltages. And in optical fiber system, the transmission losses are as low as 0.1 decibel per kilometer. So, if it is traveling through a distance of 1 kilometer, the loss will be as low as 0.1 decibel. And also, optical fibers have greater information carrying capacity due to the greater bandwidth. So, we have seen bandwidth is the range of frequencies it can carry because the range is very high. So, it has the capacity to transfer greater information. In, in some cases, we are able to send many signals through one optical fiber because of this greater 
bandwidth. If the frequency range is very high, then we can divide it into parts and each type of signal can be sent through one frequency range. So, it is also used to carry many signals through one optical fiber because of the greater bandwidth. Now, coming to the principle of fabrication means how do you fabricate an optical fiber? So, it involves two steps. Two steps. What is the step one? A glass rod having definite refractive index is constantly heated by rotating it on a flame. You take a glass rod which is made up of a dielectric material. Glass rod is a dielectric material. So it has a definite refractive index means throughout the glass rod the refractive index is uniform and it is definite and this is heated on a flame of the burner. And then silicon tetrachloride vapors are also burnt in the same flame so that an oxidized layer of silicon dioxide is uniformly deposited on the outer surface of the glass rod. Means if you take a burner, if you take a burner like this and you put a glass rod which has uniform refractive index and you keep rotating this rod and in the flames itself we introduce silicon tetrachloride. So when this glass rod is rotated in the flames what happens? A thin layer of silicon dioxide is deposited on the rod and after that what happens? The rod is gradually cooled from 1400 degrees Celsius to room temperature to form a preformed glass rod and having different outer, inner and outer glass compositions. So the inner one will form the core, the original glass rod which we have taken for heating that forms the core and the deposit of silicon dioxide that is formed on it will form a layer above it that may form the cladding. So how is it formed? Once you heat it, you are cooling it from 1400 degrees Celsius to room temperature means around 20 to 25 degrees Celsius we are cooling it. So when it is cooled the cladding is deposited on the core. So we get a preformed glass rod which has inner and outer glass compositions. Then in step 2 what we are doing the preformed glass rod is then heated in a fiber drawing furnace. We are going to keep this preformed glass rod which is having two layers in a furnace and the end of the rod is pulled at a constant rate to form a thin fiber. We will have to form thin fibers now, optical fibers. So what they are doing, they are keeping this preformed glass rod in a furnace and they are pulling it at a constant rate. Then what happens? It forms a thin fiber. Constant rate is important to draw uniform wires. So we will get a thin wire which is uniform containing the core and the cladding. Then the fiber is covered with protective plastic sheath to find a fine optical fiber. So we have seen that the three important parts is the core, the cladding and the protective sheet. After this, after pulling them into thin wires, it is covered with a protective plastic sheath. After that, they may think about the strength member and also the polyurethane outer jacket. Now, a bunch of such optical fibers form the optical fiber cable. So, whatever we see in optical fiber cable, they are uh, manufactured or they are fabricated in this process. Now the principle on which this optical fiber works. So it carries the light from one end to the other end of the fiber by total internal reflection, which we also write it in the short form as TIR. T stands for total, I stands for internal and R for reflection. So, we call it as total internal reflection. So, the main principle 
on which an optical fiber works is total internal reflection now three properties affect total internal reflection three properties of light if you see they affect this phenomenon of total internal reflection what are the three properties reflection refractive index and refraction so we will just uh, try to understand these phenomena in order to think or talk about total internal reflection so when we see about uh, this property or refractive index we need to understand about how light travels so light travels at 299 792 458 meters per second or we simply write it approximate and write it as 3 into 10 power 8 meters per second in vacuum and the speed of light we usually denote it by c whenever you write the speed of light you denote it by c and c is equal to 3 into 10 power 8 meter per second but light travels more slowly when it passes through a transparent material so when light travels its speed changes when the material changes it travels slowly through a transparent material and the degree of slowing down depends upon the material's refractive index so if the refractive index of the material varies the velocity of light also varies so how we are going to define that refractive index so refractive index of the material is given by n is equal to c upon v c here is the velocity of light and v is the velocity of light in that particular medium so n is the refractive index and here is the refractive index is equal to c upon v c is the speed of light in vacuum and v is the speed of light in that transparent material so when you know the velocity of light in that particular medium because we have seen that the velocity varies depends upon the medium so velocity of light upon the velocity in the medium will give us the refractive index of that particular material now coming to different phenomena as light wave travels through different media the speed of light wave depends upon the media so here the materials we are calling it as media as n is greater the wave has lower velocity because we have seen now n is equal to c upon v so if n is greater means when will the value of n be greater when v is less when the denominator is less the value of n will be more so n is more when v is less because c is a constant c is the velocity of light which is a constant this is a constant we have seen 3 into 10 power 8 meters per second so n is greater and then the wave has low velocity then at an interface between two media of refractive index n1 which is higher refractive index and lower refractive index n2 the ray bends as it passes from one medium to the next it is said to be refracted so we are trying to introduce a term called refraction what is refraction it is nothing but the bending of the light at the surface of separation of two different media two different media here we are calling one of refractive index n1 and the other of refractive index n2 so when a ray of light comes from a medium of refractive index n1 to a medium of refractive index n2 because it has a lower refractive index the speed will vary so because it varies it will bend and that bending of light we are calling it as refraction then if the medium to prevents the light from passing through the interface it reflects so we call it as reflection 
So when a ray of light falls on a surface and it is not able to pass through the other medium, it will reflect into the second medium, sorry, into the same medium. You call it as reflection. Now, if you understand, if this is how the light is incident, we call it as an incident ray. And the angle between the incident ray and the normal, we call it as angle of incidence. Because the ray is not able to pass through, in case it is not able to pass through, it reflects back into the same medium. You call this as the reflected ray. And this angle is the angle of reflection. And this phenomenon we are calling it as reflection. Now, if the light ray is able to pass into the second medium, at the interface, this is the interface of the two media. If I consider this air of refractive index N1 and this is the second medium of refractive index N2. Now, this ray of light is coming from one medium to the other medium. So, what happens at the surface? This light ray will bend because its speed changes. So, now if this is the angle of incidence, this will be the angle of refraction here. And this is the refracted ray. So we are calling it as refraction. So both the phenomena we are able to understand. This is what we are calling reflection. This is what we are calling as refraction. And how refractive index plays a role, a vital role in the velocity of light in different media. Now, two factors that must be considered when we talk about the degree of refraction and reflection. The angle at which the light wave strikes the surface is very important. And also the refractive index of the medium, which we have seen. If the angle of incidence varies, the angle of reflection also varies. So, the angle at which the light wave strikes the surface is also important. And one more thing, when it comes from one medium to the other medium, how is the refractive index of the medium? So, when it comes from one medium to another medium, depending upon the refractive index, the light ray will bend. So, angle at which it is striking the interface and the refractive index are two important parameters that decide the degree of refraction and reflection. Now coming to refraction, the bending of the light rays at the surface of separation of two media, that is from one medium to another medium of different densities. So this is what we are calling as refraction. Now let us understand this. If you have a glass slab like this, this is a glass slab. We have written here glass. This ray of light, which is incident on the glass, is refracting and coming out from the glass slab into air. So, the first medium here is glass and the second medium here is air. So, when you compare the two medium, glass is denser and air is rarer. So, the ray of light is now coming from one medium glass, which is denser medium, to another medium, which is rarer, to air. Then what happens? So, depending upon the angle of incidence and the media, there will be the bending of the light ray. So, when it passes from a rarer medium to a denser medium, it bends towards the normal. That means what? If at all you have a surface where this is the normal, this is the incident ray, this is the angle of incidence. If this is rarer and this is denser, then what happens? The light ray will bend towards the normal. This will be angle R. Now, if you see in the figure, when it comes from rarer to denser, it bends towards the normal 
and angle I is greater than angle R. I'll write it here. Angle of incidence is greater than angle of refraction. In other words, angle of refraction is smaller than the angle of incidence because it bends towards the normal. Now, when a light ray passes from denser medium to rarer medium, it bends away from the normal. So, we see this case. It is coming from denser medium to rarer medium. So, this is the light ray that is incident at the surface. So, because it is coming from denser to rarer, it bends away from the normal and this is R. So, if you see in this figure here, angle I is less than angle R. Angle of incidence is less than the angle of refraction. So, this is how the refractive index play a vital role in deciding the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction. Now, let us understand the Snell's law. Light traveling along the normal does not change the direction. Suppose if you have a light ray that is incident like this, it will not undergo any refraction, it will pass straight. But when light hits the interface at an angle, there is a change in light which causes, which will cause the direction change slightly and propagate in the second media with a different angle. That is what we have understood now. Now, what Snell's law says is, Snell's law is used to determine the amount of refraction that is occurring between the two media. That is N1 of lower and N2 of higher. If you are taking two media, N1 lower refractive index, N2 higher refractive index, then sine theta 2 upon sine theta 1 is equal to V2 by V1 by V2. That is equal to N2 upon N1. V1 is the velocity of light in the first medium. V2 is the velocity in the second medium. That will be equal to refractive index of the second medium with respect to the refractive index of the first medium. So, the Snell's law is defined or the formula is given by sine theta 1 by sine theta 2 is equal to N2 by N1. Now, how do we understand this total internal reflection? So, we have seen what is reflection. When the ray is coming back into the same medium, we are calling it as reflection. And when the ray is bending at the surface and coming into the other medium, then we are calling it as refraction. Now, when the angle of incidence is increased, the angle of refraction also increases. Now, we will take a particular case where a ray of light is coming from a denser medium to a rarer medium. So, this is the denser medium. This is the rarer. The blue part is the denser and the black one is the rarer. So, this is the ray of light that is incident. This is the surface of separation. This is the normal. So, as we have seen, because it is coming from denser to rarer, it bends away from the normal. Okay. This angle theta 1 is the angle of incidence and this angle is the angle of refraction. Now, suppose we increase the angle of incidence. Means, we have shifted this ray like this. This will be the ray now. This will be the angle. Now, if the angle of incidence increases, definitely the angle of refraction also has to increase. Means, the ray will bend further away from the normal. So, here we are showing the refracted ray like this. So, as you increase the angle of incidence, the angle of refraction increases and at one point, the refracted ray may graze the surface. Graze the surface means it may touch the surface. The ray is bending away and away from the normal and it slowly touches the surface. So, when it touches the surface, what is the angle of refraction here? R is equal to 90. So, at a particular angle of incidence, the angle of refraction becomes 90. So, the position uh, at the angle of refraction is 90 degrees.
Now, if you further increase the angle of incidence, what happens? So, the angle of incidence at which the angle of refraction is 90, we are calling it as critical angle. The angle of incidence at which the angle of refraction is 90, we are calling it as critical angle of the denser medium with respect to rarer medium. Means we are calling this as critical angle denoted by theta c. The critical angle is denoted by theta c. When we are calling it as theta c, when the angle of refraction is equal to 90 degree, then we are calling it as theta c. If the angle of incidence is further increased, even after this critical angle, if you further increase the angle, the angle of refraction has to further increase, means it has to go beyond 90, means what? The ray has to come back into the same medium. Means here, this angle is greater than the critical angle, then the ray will come back into the same medium. We understand we are talking about a ray which is going from denser medium to rarer medium. So, the main uh, phenomena here is refraction. So, whenever a ray of light goes from one medium to another medium of different refractive indices, it bends at the surface of separation. Now, how it bends or is, depends upon which medium to which medium it is going. When it is going from denser to rarer, it always bends away from the normal. So, if this is the angle of incidence, this is the angle of refraction. And as we go on increase the angle of incidence, the angle of refraction also increases. And at one particular angle, which we call as critical angle, the angle of refraction is 90. And if we increase the angle of incidence beyond critical angle, if I is greater than theta c, then the ray will come back into the same medium and that is what we are calling as total internal reflection, which we are denoting by TIR. It is very in important to understand total internal reflection because optical fiber works on total internal reflection. So, let us quickly see what are the three phenomena we have seen. If the angle of incidence is less than that of the critical angle, most of the light passes through into the other media. And if the angle of incidence is equal to critical angle, then most of the light travels along the surface. So, if this is the angle of incidence, this is the critical angle, then the light grazes through the surface and the angle of refraction is 90. And if the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, then the light is reflected back. So, these are the important phenomena. When it is reflected back, you are calling it as total internal reflection. It is not reflection. If it is reflection, the angle of incidence should always be equal to the angle of reflection. That is one very important law of reflection. It is not simply reflection, but it is total internal reflection. Now, the following two conditions should be satisfied for total internal reflection. When we talk about light that is propagating through an optical fiber. So, for total internal reflection to occur in an optical fiber, what are the two conditions that are very important? Just now, we have seen for total internal reflection, the first condition is light should always come from a denser medium to a rarer medium. Only then it will go away from the normal. And the second condition we have seen is the angle of incidence should be greater than the critical angle. These are the two things we have discussed for total internal reflection. Now, how do we apply it for a given optical fiber, TIR in optical fiber? If you want to have total internal reflection in an optical fiber, what are the conditions that it has to satisfy. The refractive index of the core N1 should be slightly greater than that of the cladding. N1 should be greater than N2 because the light is coming from core to cladding. There is an interface between core and cladding where the light is being 
incident. So it should always come from denser to rarer. So N1 is the refractive index of the core and N2 is the refractive index of the cladding. So when you select the optical fiber, you select the materials in such a way that the refractive index of the core is always greater than the refractive index of the cladding. Then the second point, the angle of incidence at the core cladding interface must be greater than the critical angle. This is the second condition. So when the light is incident at the core cladding interface, it should be incident at an angle greater than critical angle. So whatever materials you are using or whatever be the refractive indices of N1 and N2, you should be able to calculate the critical angle for those two materials with respect to these two materials and then find the critical angle and the light has to be incident at an angle greater than the critical angle. These two care has to be taken for light to have total internal reflection through the optical fiber. So that is what we are seeing about the principle that is a working principle, construction and working of an optical fiber. Uh, we will be discussing more about optical fiber in our next lecture. Thank you. See you again. Like, share and subscribe. Hit the bell icon for more updates.